started. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about empowering leaders, um, improving culture, and hopefully minimizing burnout. Also about how these three things can work together to further uh, each other. Um, and we'd like to start by uh, talking a little bit about our backgrounds, establish some cred. Um, we're from Arizona State University. Uh, ASU uh, has about 100,000 students, and it's one of the largest public universities in the country, if not the largest. It depends on how you do the counting. Um, this is a little snippet of the university charter that I'd like to read real quickly, but I, cause I think it really summarizes well what ASU is about and our culture, which obviously influences us as leaders. Um, ASU is a comprehensive public research university, measured not by whom it excludes, but by whom it includes and how they succeed, advancing research and discovery of public value, public value and assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. So uh, from that, I think you can see some alignment with Drupal and its values, as well as ASU's values, um, right? Uh, we measure based on who we include and the results in our community. So yeah, beyond just a technical fit for ASU, which we use a lot of Drupal, uh, it's also a community fit for us, values fit. Actually, I want to take kind of a step back real quick and I guess introduce ourselves. My name is Daniel Garcia Mont, and this is my colleague, yeah. Michael Samuelson. Um, one of the things I guess ASU has become known for in the last few years is about being the most innovative school uh, last three years running. The US News and World Report. Yeah, ranking. Um, we have strong leadership at ASU, and we're tackling big ideas, embr embracing change. Um, that's another Drupal fit, I think. So, as I mentioned, this is Michael Samuelson. Yeah, I'm Michael Samuelson. I am a senior systems analyst, aka back-end Drupal developer for the University Technology Office's uh, Applications and Design team. And uh, some of the technical highlights Though this isn't a, a technical presentation. Oh, yeah, it's your picture there, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so tech, that's why you're laughing. Uh, technical highlights of uh, you know, what I've done, again, s establishing some credibility. Uh, I've worked on a solar-based, Drupal-based, hybrid, decoupled sort of app for uh, our faculty, student, and uh, staff Thank you. directory. Also, lots of course registration systems built in Drupal that integrate with LMS, learning management system solutions, and spin up courses based on that. And uh, currently, and this is kind of an outgrowth of some of what I've learned through the course of going through burnout and the process of writing this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm exploring the intersection of uh, opportunities with Drupal, Alexa, chatbots, voice, and accessibility. And uh, it's an exciting uh, new territory. Also, uh, as far as community contributions, um, this is probably the highlight of what I've contributed back to Drupal. I don't, you probably can't read it there near the back, but I saw the need and I filled it. A few years back, I noticed that the pirate module was lacking a captain hook. So I supplied it. It actually, it actually serves a purpose. So uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of my shining moment in contrib. So. And also uh, something I do is I, I uh, coach youth robotics. Uh, is anybody here familiar with FIRST Robotics? Yes. FIRST Robotics is awesome. Uh, 
they can always use mentors in programming. You don't have to know the technology they're, they're working with. You can learn along with the kids. It's, it's something I encourage looking into. Firstinspires.org. I always have to put in a plug for that. Uh, my daughter got me into it, but uh, I've stayed around even after she graduated out of the program. So, so this is kind of my slide. Uh, some people say the best leaders are, are the best leadership styles, unintrusive, almost as if they're not there. <laughs> so, as I said, um, I'm Daniel. I'm actually the manager. I'm Michael's manager. Uh, so I'm here mostly to take credit for all the hard work that Michael's going to do in this presentation. Um, most of my professional life has been at ASU. Um, I've been, I did the math this morning, and I've been doing web development work for about the last uh, 23 years, um, which is more than half of my life, if you go all the way back to when I was a student worker. Um, Six years as a professional, as a, an individual contributor, doing web development and sysadmin, admin, mostly for Drupal. Um, and um, two years as a lead, and about almost three years uh, as a manager. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm a, I would say I'm a recovering Drupal developer. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked both in operations and development groups. Um, I currently lead a team with 11 Drupal developers, plus two recovering developers, not including myself. Uh, one of them actually is specializing in web accessibility, and the other one is in uh, user experience design. So uh, the following presentation is based on real life events. So in other words, it's anecdotal. Um, but even though it's anecdotal, we believe that our experience will resonate with you, especially if you're a developer or if you manage developers. Um, and we hope that the lessons we've taken from those experiences will be of value, and that's manager speak. Um, how many of you here made it to the uh, keynote on Tuesday? Good. Um, Dries actually touched on one of the topics we'll be covering when he announced the uh, Drupal community principles. Um, and when he highlighted uh, principle number six, uh, choose to lead, uh, which I thought was neat. Um, we didn't have any foreknowledge of that. It's just pure coincidence. But um, I, I really found it uh, neat how we as a community um, are aligning, and that's more manager speak. Um, and since this is a presentation about empowering leaders, I'm going to empower Michael to run through the rest of it. So, uh, you know, that was about us, but uh, a little quick segment on you. Um, who of you are from the freelance or agency world? Okay, and how many from enterprise, like academia, I would say, you know, it, large size organizations. Okay, we've got about a 50-50 split, and that's, that's great. Uh, we have something for everybody. So, uh, you know, we're going to cover a framework to understand burnout, avoid it, hopefully, deal with it. Um, if, you know, if you came here for the leadership, you're going to get leadership too. Uh, the, and uh, it ties right in with avoiding burnout. So, a little bit more about me, and I'm, then I'm going to kind of shut up about me, and we're going to start talking about burnout. Um, as a developer, I've you know we have this this notion of the rock star developer who you know comes in, and when I think rock star, I think guitar solo, right? That's that's what pops into my mind is someone noodling out there, really going to town. Uh, trashing hotel rooms, and then they leave either the studio or the hotel room, and then somebody has to come in and put things back together or record the, the rhythm <laughs> section along with the click, click track, you know, and, and really uh, put things together. Um, you know, that quite often that's a person who is given the sheet music, and, you know, they execute on that. And for the longest time, that's how I have thought of myself as a developer. 
It's like, you know, give me the sheet music, give me the requirements. I'm here for how we're gonna get this done, what didn't really matter much to me. And so that was something I had imposed upon myself, but it also was a personality fit for myself. You know, and I, my position title is Senior Systems Analyst, and I think you know, disciplined and regimented kind of is something that goes along with, with that title and probably makes me a good systems analyst, but it doesn't necessarily describe a rock star. So, um, my story of burnout, uh, it happened for a lot of little reasons, and I don't really plan on going into them very much. You know, I could talk about how I work remote 100% of the time. Even though I work for Arizona State University, I live in Idaho. Um, so other than two weeks out of the year when I go down to Tempe to visit, um, I'm in a house with me and my chihuahua and my miniature pincher working away. Um, but uh, I could also go into, you know, feeling like I'd plateaued and I wasn't seeing new challenges, but those are my problems. They're not necessarily your problems and probably doesn't matter to you. I think you probably know what your problems are or you can take the time to figure them out. So what I really wanna do here is to provide a framework for understanding burnout and how to avoid it. You know, as a developer, right, I know that the best frameworks provide structure, direction, and detail, yet they don't have so much opinion that they get in the way, right? They point us in a direction and they equip us, but they don't prescribe. So there's this story that I've heard. Some of you may have heard it as well. It's one of those things that gets passed around, like, uh, you know, we, we uh, swallow six spiders while we're sleeping over the course of our lives. That's sort of a, you know, on average sort of a thing, which somewhere I heard was actually uh, not true. It was like a, a test that, uh, you know, some uh, intelligence agency put that out there to see how, how uh, that would spread virally way back in the day. Um, but so there's this other story, though, about how to train a circus flea. And uh, the way it goes is, you know, you don't want them to jump out of the, the container that you have for them at the circus. And there's other stories, but this story goes that you take the flea and you put it in a jar and you screw a lid on. And that flea that can normally jump very high quickly learns that it's going to bump its head if it jumps that high. So it learns to jump below the lid. And then you can take the lid off and dump it in the circus and it's never gonna jump higher than where that lid was. And you know that, I like that even if it isn't true because it is true in the sense that it describes habituation. You know, we have lots of lids that either are imposed upon us or we impose upon ourselves. They may be based on our fears, they may be based on what have you, you know, you can fill it in. So, uh, you know, essentially habituation holds your whole self back and you're not, or you're, you're putting yourself in a position to experience burnout, right, if you're not expressing your full self. So here's, we're starting to get to the meat now. Uh, this is part one of the framework, L-E-D. And don't think light, think lead. A dull, gray, toxic metal, uh, right? The L, a lack of efficiency. That could be a sense of lacking efficiency. It doesn't have to be actual lack of efficiency, right? Just the, the sense of hopelessness or, you know, what am I doing here? This is day in and day out, I'm squashing these bugs. There's always more bugs, right? Or uh, it could be exhaustion, just feeling tired, or disowning. You know, this is uh, not owning the problem or choosing not to solve it. 
or feeling trapped, you know, basically not owning the solution. And I think this is one that kind of opens the door to why leadership is important yeah, in avoiding burnout. Because if you don't feel like you can solve the problem or you're not gonna lead, if you have a lid screwed on there and you're not going to try and solve the problem, you can experience burnout. So it's a handy little mnemonic with a, with a visual of lead metal, so hopefully it's memorable. Um, so I went through a period where I was feeling a lot of burnout over a year ago, and whenever I would get that feeling uh, in a particularly bad way, I'd you know, do what anybody would do. I'd go to the Oracle of Delphi <laughs> and uh, you know, ask, you know, how do I, how do I uh, deal with burnout or how do I recover from burnout? And you know what I learned? Uh, not a whole lot. I got a lot of uh, blog posts on sites that also are full of life hacks and things like that. So, you know, it was, it was very much uh, popular psychology sorts of answers. Things like recharge your batteries or go for a walk, take breaks. Great, yeah, I, I can continue bailing water out of the boat the rest of my life. I want to know how to fix the leak. So one day, when I'm going to Google, I had the idea, hey, you know, I'm going to add peer-reviewed to my search. How do I deal with burnout peer-reviewed? Let's get some actual academic understanding here. And that cracked the world wide open for me. Um, you know who gets burned out? I, I'll give one person a guess. Who, who gets burned out? Like, it's a big problem, a career field other than developers. Teachers. Teachers. Doctors. Physicians. And they're also pretty good at science. So there's some good information out there on doctors dealing with burnout. And burnout in a doctor, like with disowning and exhaustion and having that feeling of, I don't care how this turns out, I'm not invested in this, that's not a good thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, they also suffer from something called compassion fatigue. There's literature on that. Um, and I, I would say that any of you who've spent any amount of time in an issue queue just solving user-reported bugs for a couple weeks straight knows what compassion fatigue is. <laughs> Not. One last story before we jump off from doctors and start talking about what I learned. Um, my wife hates it when I tell this story, but uh, one time I was at the doctor and I was getting uh, my, you know, talking to the doctor and he wanted to have my blood drawn to uh, you know, find out, you know, to look at the results and see, you know, diagnose the problem. And I looked over at my wife and I said, oh my gosh, that's just like when I ask operations for the logs because I want to figure out what's going wrong in production, and I don't have access to it. He just wants to read the logs. I said, wow, that means like what I do is like what a doctor does. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, crud. He doesn't know either. <laughs> and then my wife looked at me, and she said, yeah, if you get your job wrong, nobody dies. And I said, well, they might. <laughs> So I, I talked about this before, you know, the, the old saw, the, the metaphor of I'm burned out, my batteries are low, I've got to recharge my batteries. I hate this metaphor. And this is, the, this is the common metaphor for being burned out. What happens when you have, let's say, your child has a toy, a talking doll, and the batteries get low on that thing? First, it's going to start talking creepy for a little while. That's maybe the disowning happening. But then it's just going to stop talking. It's done. It's inert. It becomes an object. And OK, yeah, that describes being burned out a little bit, but it's just descriptive. It doesn't give us any way to really figure out how to help the situation. The metaphor I like is bank accounts. 
And this is one that I came across in a couple places in the literature about doctors and burnout. One of the things I like about the bank account metaphor is, unlike with batteries, you're not just drawing from one. You can have multiple bank accounts. And the way I've, it's broken out here, I have it. I, again, this is part two of the framework for dealing with burnout. It's PEP. See how this works out? It's pretty nice. And that's what you're trying to get back, is PEP. Um, the, the first P is physical, you know, your physical account, right? How do you feel? Then uh, there is your emotional social account. And then you have your purposeful or meaningful account, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of the, the classic mind, body, spirit breakdown, essentially, right? I don't have them in that order. Um, Another reason why I like the bank account metaphor is, unlike the metaphor of batteries, when your battery runs out, it just stops, right? With a bank account, when one account gets low, what do you do? You transfer money in from another account. If you're feeling emotionally burned out, or you know, emotionally overdrawn, you can still function, you can still show up at work, you can still do your job, you just might start to see you're having to pull out of your physical reserves. Maybe you're sick more often. You're pulling out of your sense of purpose there. Right? It, it's, a, it's a network of things that are all tied together. And if you pull one down, there's some adjacency there, and it pulls the others down. Think of a net. right? Or if you lift one up, you can pull the others up as well. The third reason I like the bank account metaphor is it gives us some interventions. I think that's kind of you know, doctor speak for you know, how, to, how to solve stuff. Um, right, and there's two ways to intervene with burnout and this, using this framework. You know, one is to make deposits. The other is to change your spending. So, how do you make deposits? Well, physically, you know that, <laughs> right? And this, this is the stuff, a lot of this stuff is kind of the, the things that you see in the pop psychology, but it's workable and it's not just, uh, it's simplistic. You can see that it's a, you know, there's multiple dimensions here. So physically, eat healthy, sleep, exercise, you know, emotionally, um, take breaks if you're somebody who tends to work eight hours straight like I do, or uh, you know, socially, uh, join a club, you know, get out, meet people. Work on your family relationships, put down your phone, that sort of thing. Uh, purposeful, meaningful, set an intention at the beginning of the day to find the that's why I do this job moments, right? Um, you know, maybe you're stuck in an issue queue and it's <laughs> driving you crazy, but what you really love to do is solve problems. Well, there's problems here. You're maybe not framing it right. So, right, make deposits. Invest in yourself, essentially. And the, reducing spending, this is the other intervention, right? Uh, can change your uh, narrative, your personal narrative. I kind of have a, a little uh, rabbit trail here. I could have done a whole presentation on personal narrative. You know, it's the story you tell yourself about your life and what you're doing, what you're going through. It has a huge impact on you. Um, you don't always recognize it, but you know, sometimes we cast ourselves in the role of victim or the survivor or the hero, right? And it has an impact on what we do. Um, one of the things I've learned and what I have loved about coaching robotics, kids in robotics, is that the challenges that they face and they work on are very similar to those that we work on in our jobs. And uh, it, it's really served as kind of this meta-analysis for me to see 
how teams work and how leaders are born and how technical complex problems can be solved and how people who are bashful in the face of a challenge can rise to it. You know, um, and so I've, I've taken from that and realized, you know, my role in it is that of a coach and, you know, the coach is the voice that supports and helps people to become their best self. And I, what I've taken from that personal narrative wise is to be my own coach and that inner voice that I have should sound more like a coach and less like a critical person. Anyways, we're off the rabbit trail. If you found that stuff interesting, you might consider a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. I'm not into tennis, I loved this book. I read it and then I listened to it on tape multiple times. It's, it's uh, from the 70s, slightly dated, but it's the book that launched the sports psychology trend. Um, but so back to reducing spending, right? Um, you can reframe problems. Sorry about the gold on white back there in the back. Um, I'll read these off. Communicate with leadership about your challenges or the needs you face. Seek a change in your responsibilities in work or in life. Reward yourself. Um, in your organization, you could delegate or collaborate. You could affect change to reduce those circumstances that are draining on you. You could start, a, start the conversation. I did in my organization. I, I asked Daniel, hey, I've been learning some about burnout. Can I talk about it to the team? I brought it in and it was a great conversation. There were, I think, people on our team that felt like, oh, you can talk about this stuff? <laughs> you know, sometimes people don't want to, right? You might have a culture where like any sign of struggle is uh, difficult to talk about, but uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we struggle every day in our jobs. Um, and then, you know, you could look at uh, reducing spending by figuring out what works for you with work-life balance, work-life separation, work-life alignment, whatever works for you. I'm not going to say there's one right way there. Um, but I do want to point out that all of these in gold have something to do with another theme in this presentation, and that's leadership. So I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, but first, so the question as a manager, what can you do? It depends. Um, a few years ago, I came across uh, the uh, description of the servant leader model. Is anyone here familiar with that? I, I found it really interesting and really resonated with me. It's the idea that your team doesn't work for you as the manager or director or the leader. You work for the team. Your job is to make sure that the team succeeds uh, as an organization and um, also at the individual level. You're there to help your teammates um, succeed. Um, and in order to do that, you have to know your team, right? You have to build a rapport, you have to build trust and create the right conditions so that they feel comfortable coming to you, being open with you. Right? Um, and so what you will do will depend on the individual and their specific set of circumstances. Um, so for example, um, I had a colleague who I, I, I won't name uh, to protect his privacy, um, who, it was about a year ago, uh, came to me <laughs> because he was feeling burnt out. Right now, uh, this individual, um, you know, he's. I, I was very lucky that um, he's a great troubleshooter, right? So he had gone through the process to troubleshoot himself and what was going on, and he's also a, you know, a self leader. So um, I remember in talking to him, my initial reaction was 
oh, he has too much work on his plate. You know, let's start, you know, pulling back uh, some of that work or, or the work that's kind of grinding at him. Um, and it turns out that that wasn't the solution, right? Um, and so uh, I'm going to jump actually real quick. The key was listening, right? Um, by listening, rather than just jumping the gun and, and acting, we were able to work together on a plan um, to help him mitigate, get out of that burnout uh, zone he was in, right? Um, but if you're not that lucky, um, you know, uh, start by looking for lead and teach pep and empower leaders. And as far as that last one, um, it's about empowering the right person, right? Not everyone wants to be a leader. Not everyone wants to be empowered. Uh, so it goes back to knowing your team, right? Um, yeah, for, for instance, for the longest time, I was happy to be that session musician, right? There's, there's this continuum I've seen about uh, <clears throat> people's careers that when you start out, you're at dependence, you need maybe some help in your job so, and direction, then you reach independence where I can do this job by myself, but, you know, give me stuff to do. Um, and then interdependence would be kind of starting to reach that level where, hey, I kind of need to lead here so that things are working in a direction that makes sense for me because I've, I've grown and I need challenges. Um, so yeah, when, with uh, the initial response of, oh, we can take something off your plate and lighten the load on you, you know, at first, the feeling that that gave me was this implosion <laughs> in my chest. It was like, no, I need the meaning. <laughs> I want bigger challenges, not fewer. Um, and so, and so I, I told Daniel that. He's you know, a great boss to have that way. You know, I can uh, be open about those things. And uh, you know, when you have that, um, opportunity to be honest about the direction you want to go, what's going on, you can take proactive steps. In our case, um, my boss's boss introduced us to the concept of stretch assignments, and that is basically allowing a person to work outside of their comfort zone or their zone of knowledge their, their zone of expertise. And I did a stint with our uh, business intelligence group um, and created a, uh, well, I, I wanted to go in the, the data science direction and I was, I was uh, working a lot on that, but the, the business intelligence group actually uh, started doing some work with Alexa. So I got involved in taking that that uh, directory that I showed you earlier and turning that into a, a voice-enabled uh, Alexa skill. And you know, got a lot of ideas out of that. Thought, oh, wow. You know, with our group that you know, I was currently in, apart from the stretch assignment, you know, we're tasked with accessibility. What are the implications of a of, of voice interface for accessibility and how can we augment that? reinvigorated my sense of the job that I had been doing where I felt like I had plateaued. And right, so you know, a leader shouldn't be threatened by those under them seeking to try different things because that can kind of be where innovation occurs. You know, it's, it's an opportunity, not a threat. And you don't want somebody who's burned out on your team. You want somebody who's you know, got a healthy drive to them. So, you know, even though it's, it's hard to acquire developers and keep developers, happy developers are better than <laughs> crabby developers. So, 
<clears throat> and right, we all have this, this need for mastery, autonomy, and purpose. I really restrain myself from turning this into a third part of the framework and doing map. <laughs> Get your map, find your way. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I, I, I still kind of inserted it in there. Right? I can't turn this stuff off. My mind's always going. Um, so right, overcoming burnout, like the, the, the popular psychology says, you know, it's about uh, doing less work. And that's, that's not true. You know, it's, it's about uh, cultivating meaning in the work that you do and leading yourself with pep accounts in mind. So let's review that, the physical, emotional, purposeful. And it's about uh, moving from a lead mindset, both senses of the word, to that of a leader, a leader with boots on the ground. And it's about realizing we're all leaders. In the least, you lead yourself. So I didn't go to school to get an MBA. Leadership, management, for the longest time for me, those were kind of the same thing. Leadership was good authority and management was bad authority. That was basically, basically my, the level of, uh, of uh, maturity of my understanding of those terms. And they're very different. But before we get there, let's take a look at organizational structure. So. Some of you are from enterprise. This is a very enterprise structure right here, right? Individual contributor, usually at the bottom. Um, then the expert or manager who leads teams or projects. That's us. I'm a, I'm a team, a technical team lead. Um, then there's leaders of other leaders, and they tend to be you know, how information moves up and down the organization. Leaders of divisions, and then leaders of the organization itself. And ASU, you know, one of the largest uh, universities in the United States, this holds true, like to a T almost. It, it's kind of scary. Um, but for small organizations, you know, those of you in uh, uh, agencies or uh, maybe just you know, smaller companies, um, you know, some of these, these lines are knocked out, and you might be dealing with even something more uh, unstructured, like a minimalist org, or, well, we all deal with Drupal.org and the way the Drupal community works, and that's, that's very different, right? Um, so there's a, we, we tend to make some mistakes when we associate these terms solely with like a position on an org chart because they're different. Um, you know, authority is something that's granted by a group to somebody they trust and who's persuasive or it could be somebody who's warm and competent. It really depends on the culture that you're in, but authority is granted. And that group also, it could be just a group of individuals in, on Drupal.org in an issue queue. Like, I would say every issue queue itself has its own group, right? Who are we going to listen to? Whose patch makes sense here, right? Um, whose idea is going to win out? You know, who, who's going to lead us there? Um, but then, you know, you also have groups that are formal, such as the org's chart. Right. So rather than seeing leaders as bad managers and managers as bad leaders, we need to push past that and realize that leaders and managers are both necessary and they have different roles. A leader is tasked with setting direction and vision and helping the team enact change and be their best selves. And that's hard, enacting change in an organization. Very hard. Um, managers, on the other hand, which managers 
tend to be those that are attached to a node on the org chart. You know, a manager is uh, there to ensure operational excellence and delivery. Kind of managers kind of have a tough job and they kind of don't get credit for you know, having to crack the whip sometimes. We need managers, right? If you have an organization where you have really strong leadership, but a lack of management, you might be going from one hot mess to another. And inversely, strong management but no leadership, the sense of why this manager is wielding power over me or telling me to do things, they feel bossy, right? I would say, you know, like calling someone a boss, that's a, that's a, a manager. That, that's what, you know, we, bad management, but not necessarily. So we all have an opportunity to be a leader, but we're not all you know, granted that management position in the org chart. And I talked about this before, right? Authority can be granted by the organization or the group. Uh, managers tend to be granted by the organization, but anyone who leads can be granted authority by the group. So you can have top-down leadership and bottom-up leadership. Top-down leadership is the traditional way that we look at it, but bottom-up leadership I think makes some people nervous, but it doesn't need to because there's this management term called alignment. We've already used it a few times, and basically that just means that the goals of the organization from the top to the bottom kind of line up. So you can have people at the bottom suggesting things, people at the top saying, you know, this is our big goal, and people at the bottom with, hey, I'd like to do this or that, right? So it also brings in the idea of strategy and tactics. And I wasn't really aware until I started reading about this stuff, the difference between the two. You know, strategy is a goal with a long term to it. And a tactic is a small, a short term means towards achieving that strategy. Right, so there's a complement here. And you, you can have, I would say at the lower levels, right, your sorts of leadership can be tactical but you can also influence the strategic. Um, and quite often, like you can have management at the top see good ideas bubbling up from the bottom and have that affect strategy at the top. So it's a source of innovation to have strong leadership at the bottom where the boots are on the ground. I didn't put it in here, but I had a uh, a picture that I came across, it was really great, it was a, a package, I don't know if it was from Amazon or what, but somebody had unboxed this order that they had and it was, they had ordered bubble wrap, right? This big roll of bubble wrap, but it was surrounded by bubble wrap <laughs> inside the container. It's like, if the people at the bottom were empowered, that wouldn't have happened, right? It was like, we don't need this, but somebody, you know, if, if you're not empowered, it's like, I'm gonna follow the rules and just do what I'm supposed to do. That sort of thing happens, right? You, do, you can't kind of uh, improvise when it makes sense. So, that's why we do that. Some of you who have you know, experience in the business world are like, oh wow, I'm glad uh, I just you know, went through you know, <laughs> MBA 101 again or whatever, but uh, I have a feeling a lot of you um, have careers that started kind of like mine, right? I, I uh, didn't have a business background, just started doing development and then, you know, people start doing web work and then, oh, I've got an agency suddenly and I have employees and knowing these terms, huh, maybe you missed them, right? You've, you're probably practicing the concepts, but having the words is always empowering. So, we're almost done with the leadership speak. Um, you know, the, there's this archetypal organizational interaction I have here. You know, essentially, right, the top sets the, the, the hill to climb and the bottom decides, okay, how are we gonna get there? 
and the top can say, hey, I don't like that idea, can you come up with another one? You know, if, when the top starts to get into the how, that's what we call micromanaging, and we don't like it. Nobody likes micromanaging, and we call it micromanaging. Um, you know, it, it's a pejorative term because it's not pleasant, because it disempowers those underneath, and it's not empowering. And it's a petri dish for burnout. So <clears throat> this system requires trust to have top-down, bottom-up leadership. But the, the great news is that uh, people who are doing something that they're invested in are trustworthy, more trustworthy than somebody you have to ride like a horse to get them to the finish line. So you know, when you're your own leader, you manage your own meaning and purpose and the other balances in your PEP accounts. Right, so see how this kind of dovetails back into that framework. And uh, you work to find a meaningful alignment within your organization where a mutually beneficial outcome is achieved. Okay. Uh, on the way over, on the airplane I was reading and I discovered that, oh, I reinvented the wheel. This is called job crafting. This is a thing where you kind of take leadership and ownership of your position and try different things and kind of create your position in the organization and maybe innovate as a result of that. So if you're interested in it, look it up, job crafting. There's a nice body of work out there. So the framework, coming back to that, this is the algorithm to apply. If you feel like lead, adjust and invest in your PEP accounts and then lead. And you know, session musicians, there's numerous stories of session musicians who went on to become rock stars. You can write your own music. And uh, here's a list of uh, suggested reading if any of this stuff is interesting to you. Uh, I know I enjoy it to no end. <laughs> Drive people crazy with talking about it. But uh, yeah, look it up. There's, there's lots of great resources there. Um, business models for teams, that's a really great one about entrepreneurship, but also team alignment and uh, individual growth. The uh, inner game of tennis I talked about, Deep Work by Cal Newport, that one is about, it's kind of tangentially related, but it's, it's about, uh, has anyone here read it? It was kind of big a while back. It's about draining the shallows, you know, all, the, all those things that you do in your job that are um, kind of wasteful activity. Like for me, I'll have days where I just am doing environmental scans. It's like, okay, I've got all these to-do items, check this, nothing, you know, I'm still waiting on something there, I'm just waiting over here, waiting over here. And you just kind of end up in that whirlpool where you're doing that all day and sending emails and you're in meetings and the day's over and you realize I got nothing done. This book is about you know, realizing that anybody can do that. What you're paid for is to do deep work that is meaningful and it has some strategies and thoughts on how to uh, organize your day and your work in order to go deep and like be valuable. Uh, aligning for success, it's about alignment. Harvard Business Review's 10 Must Reads on Leadership. It's good stuff. Um, kind of the, the seminal you know, articles over the last, I don't know how many years on leadership. The Crazy One podcast and High Resolution. They're both uh, um, great podcasts on, actually I'm not a designer, I'm a developer, but they are on design, but they also talk a lot about leadership. Uh, high Resolution is interviews with uh, leaders in the design community, you know, people from Airbnb to IBM, those sorts of folks. Um, and then uh, the crazy one is uh, Stephen Gates, who is somebody who was interviewed in high resolution. That's how I discovered his stuff. And it's on leadership and your career, all that. So uh, with that, yeah. I'll leave you with Daniel. To kind of recap on on the manager leadership side of things. Um, I think really it's about fomenting um, 
trust with your team, getting to know your team um, individually and listening to them and working with them. Um, I think that creates a better culture. It helps you identify leaders that then you can empower as a manager. And um, hopefully, uh, I will avoid, if not minimize, burnout. So I think that's pretty much it on the nutshell. And I think with that, we can open it up to questions. Yeah, everybody has questions. Thank you. Well, actually, I have a question. Huh? Yeah. Just, yeah. Don't answer this question. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about in PEP, which is a really good and interesting thing. But what if you don't know who you are? Like yourself, like uh, you were talking about different stacks, uh, social, emotional. Well, on uh, the investing in PEP, there was one of the purposeful bullet points was journaling. Ah. Something like that, right? That's, that's an activity that a person can do that starts to, you know, it's a discipline that, that uh, asks a person to start to put into words um, what they do, right? And so it, it's a... It's the act of creating meaning and discovering who you are. So. That was a really good talk. Um, I, I think working as like a developer, I can relate. I've never been like so burned out that I'm like just wanting to get away, but I've had days like that and then I enjoy the weekend. Uh, but one of my questions is, I've noticed uh, in my work culture, in I'll say like higher education, there tends to be a lot of people that don't like to mix personal with professional for fear of getting to know somebody too well, right? Like you don't want to cross into that area. So how do you like professionally and intimately like get to know your team without making it you know, too personal Without or uncomfortable. Without oversharing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, well, it's, yeah, some of it is knowing the culture. Um, and it's also, if you're, like, for instance, needing to have a conversation about, I feel burned out here, make a business case for it. You know, you can, you can take your needs and make a business case for your needs. And without having to bring you too much into it. Um, and, yeah. and I think it's a challenge at yeah. the, uh, the management level too, because I know I strive to be open with my teammates and to make them feel like they can come to me, right? But even then, um, there's been a couple of times where I felt kind of blindsided, right? Um, and you know, I would start asking myself, you know, why, you know, why couldn't they have come to me ahead of time, or why didn't they feel like they could come to me, um, you know, before it got to this point, right? And so, yeah, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I know in my case, I was actually promoted from within the team, so I had a lot of these relationships as a peer uh, before, which I think um, helps, right? But um, it's not a silver bullet. Um, I think you just have to prepare yourself for, and not take it personally, right? Um, just uh, put yourself out there as a leader and, um, you know, do, do your best um, to uh, work with them when yeah. it gets to that point, right? And context matters, right? You, like you said, being blindsided. Don't, don't bring up, you know, hey, I'm burned out in a team meeting. Do it in a, you know, one-on-one -on -one with uh, your manager, right? Um, maybe, you know, looking at a performance review or something of that sort. And then also, like, the performance review is a, a great opportunity to start showing leadership and say, hey, I've got, you know, for the next year, can we, and this is part of what I'm saying about, you know, make a business case for it, is... Uh, I would like to try tackling these problems or you know, working on leveraging some opportunities rather than just working on you know, 
solving problems that are, you know, exist and are, will always be there. Um, you know, you, you tie it to your performance and make it something that your boss can hold you accountable to. So, you know, in a way, you're, right, you're using the correct venue to change the direction of your job. It's, you know, it's, it's a bit of leadership. <laughs> right. well, well, thank you yeah. once again for uh, coming for a second. Good question. <laughs>
run through it real quick and uh, I don't but um Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this one. Mm -hmm. Martin. So it's not yet. Uh, yeah. And it's Martin. So. Yeah, I don't know. 
<laughs> so I ended up kind of like looking into like how to nice. deal with him and I was like, hey, this is a girl, this is me. Um, and um, so psychology is really interesting to me too. Right? Because they were studying some of these experiments. But that's promising though. Like they can actually look at some dogs and they can actually maintain the situation where they focus so on the they They like hit all these kind of rigorous controls. Well, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's been a typical job, like basically. Yes, the, the shocking on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard about that study. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Instead of learning to jump to safety, like in certain circumstances, they just hunkered down and went through it. Yeah. Okay. So you saw your researcher, then technical community, and contract. So he has like that for nothing.